So a very warm welcome to our in-house participants as well as our colleagues. And then we've got 24 people on the online platform. Um, it's really nice to see all of you there. We don't see all of your names. Maybe you just want to change your name um, on the online platform because then we can also see who we're talking to. So I'm Professor Viana Goliath. I'm the acting HOD in the Department of Social Development. And um, it's very nice to, to welcome you here today to our post-grad information session. I'm standing in for Professor Zaleka Soji, who is the director of school. Uh, Prof has a medical procedure today, so sincere apologies from her side. And she was going to do the welcoming. So on behalf of her uh, as the director, we see a lot of our own graduates here. And also on the online platform, it's really nice to welcome you back home and hoping that you will then be in this home as your academic home as postgrad students. And we're hopeful that it will be an informative session and that you will use the space to ask questions and clarify as much as you need clarity today. Okay, so that's the, the warm welcome. Um, then I'm going to dive straight into my presentation, which is then to specifically look at uh, who we are as a department of social development professions and what makes us distinct. Uh, and I've just summarized it as the fact what, what makes us distinct is actually our vision. It's articulated in our vision um, as a department. And that is that we aspire to be a vibrant, authentic, and engaged department that's recognized for training well-rounded and contextually relevant social workers. And we have a lot of PREC partners here as well. So you can tell us whether we're heading in the right direction for that vision. And we're wanting what makes us further distinct is that in having that as our foreground, we want to be responsive to the diverse needs and not just go and photocopy, cut and paste, you know, in practice. And through that, we want to facilitate meaningful change. Um, as a department, we've also started embracing more inter and transdisciplinary work in our focus, both as research and in engagement. And if that is what makes us distinct, the question is then what does this mean for, I'm trying to move this thing away, yeah? Yeah, what does this mean? Drag and drop. Okay, let's see how I drag. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so what does this mean for our postgrad research if that is what makes us distinct? Um, and yeah, I just spoke to then what is in our mission that when you think about your research topic, we want you to think about a topic that will be responsive to societal challenges and community challenges. You don't want to do a piece of study that's going to go sit on a, you know what? I think I'm not unmuted on my word. No, 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 no. Yes, I keep myself myself oh, thank you. Philip, it's so wonderful to have you here. <laughs> thank you. Sure. I just thought I'm going to have to repeat all of that, Philip, imagine. <laughs> so, so what this means for our postgrad research uh, colleagues is that you obviously want to, we would like to see that your research is a topic that would be responsive to societal and community challenges. And I'm thinking back to the time when I did my doctoral study and we had this Dutch professor that said to me, I'm doing backyard research. So I'm doing research that is, you know, similar to the home turf I grew up in, and he referred to that as backyard research. But as a department that is foregrounding decolonial, a decolonial and an indigenous approach, we want you to do backyard research. Okay, so on your home turf, that is in responsive to those challenges that you're working with, that you've been trying as a practitioner. Um, to work with. And of course, it's a problem that can't be responded to as effectively in practice, but the research can serve that very viable option for you. So furthermore, what it means is exactly what I've just said, that we really want a decolonial focus. You're wanting to look at um, what is fit for purpose 
you know, is this lens you're looking through from the theoretical framework, you're going to choose to the method, the research method that you're going to choose. Is it speaking to the community? Is it speaking to the, you know, the client base that you're going to go do your research with? That people can, it's, is it relatable? Is it relatable? And is it something that um, is obviously going to be meaningful for them as well? We then want our research to inform social work practice. So we're not just doing research for the sake of our qualification and to bring about change in those practice spaces, but we actually want to inform our theory, what we teach in the classroom. There's a lot of learning that's generated from research that tells us, you know, what you're doing in the classroom is, is not on point and, and that it needs to change, right? So it's informing practice and it's then um, informing our the theories that we're teaching as well. What it means further for your research is that, and this is what makes us, that sets us apart from uh, what I refer to as common sense approaches, right? That we want our research to be underpinned by social work theories. And from a decolonial approach, we, we at the moment grappling with what that means. You know, so what does these social work theories mean? And what are the theories that have been silent? Which are those theories we've not heard about and written about? We obviously wanted to be grounded in values of social justice, and that is relational centered because we're doing research with humans and we're doing research to address injustices. And then, of course, like I said to you, we've embraced inter and transdisciplinary focus in our work. So, collaborative partnerships between yourself, your supervisor, and then the research partners that you will have your participants and your gatekeepers. If the greater the relational value in, in that body, the greater your chances of having not just success, you know, but impact as well. Okay. Right, so I'm moving along. So I suppose this is also now click and grab, Philip. Okay, there we go, or click and drop. Then I'll pull it up again. So in terms of what does this mean for how we support our postgrad students, I'm still speaking under the banner of what makes us unique, right? And then what does this mean for your research? And now I'm coming to what does this mean for you as a person, as a student? Um, as you see today, we have a postgrad orientation. So this is your first point of contact, even before you apply to engage with the people that will sit with your application, but also the very people that will be accompanying you in the research journey. Uh, second to that, we will have supportive workshops. It's a like two evening workshops of two hours at a time where you can then refine your research focus. So it's a sort of like a guided writing space for you with our postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Busi Lujabe where you can, she will help you narrow down the research question and then the methodology. And remember, those are preliminary thoughts that you're having. We're not expecting a tailored proposal at all. We want to see that it's a workable proposal. And that's the purpose for having the guided writing space for you, uh, that you have comfort in what you are submitting and you know it's something workable. Yeah. Um, following on that, we will then have a selection interview with the candidates that make it through the paper selection. And in the interview, we will ask you to speak a little bit about your research focus. You know, so why? Uh, because we're not part of the guided writing workshop that Dr. Lujabi will do with you online. But in the selection interview that's done by a panel of three staff members, you have a further opportunity to speak about the topic, you know, think through the critical questions that the colleagues will give you. Um, and then especially what's the intended social value that your study will have. Following on that, once you're now accepted into the program, there is a departmental orientation program. And at the departmental orientation program, so this is with all the accepted students and the supervisors and the coordinator of this program, Dr. Abdullah, we will then have a, sorry, let me just pull this up now. 
Okay, so at this orientation session, good afternoon, sir, welcome. At this orientation session, we will then, there will be space for you to go back to, to the concept note in that orientation session already where your supervisors will come in. And then of course, as soon as you are accepted into the program, we try to do our allocation of the supervisors timeously. Then you know what the person you will be working with and students start engaging long before they've been accepted. The risk we run, I must say this up front, the risk we run with that is that we're investing human labor and resources that students we've had that the odd student that have taken the work then to another institution. Yes, so that's been a bit of a downer for us that we've invested the resources and the time and finances. And then, but like I said, it's really been in the, in the minimal. Ne? Right, so I've indicated that you are then accompanied by a supervisor. And then there's also a faculty-based orientation workshop that's given to postgrad students. And then there are institutional support workshops that you can attend as well. And our department have a student uh, peer support program. So on the WhatsApp group, the postgrad students are present and they are guiding and supporting each other. Um, even if it's just moaning about the supervisor that's taking a bit longer to get the work back to them. It is a space where you mobilize and when you, where you exchange ideas as well. And what we're working towards more proactively this year is then to have the in-house workshops as well. So we have a workshop coming up for our first year postgrad students that's going to specifically speak about, do you mind me, Dr. Abdullah, what's the first one about? Dr. Perema, your, your first one that's coming up. Okay, so it's writing that introduction and the context of, of the study. Né? And so the format of the proposal is taken and then the workshops are sort of like split up according to that format. Um, later in the year, it will be myself and Mr. Kweso that then look at the methodology. So that guided support is there. Postgrad students, it's voluntary. Uh, we hope that everybody takes it up that's enrolled. Uh, but it's where you also help one another, you know, to check if your understanding of this design is similar to what the other person is saying. And it really is the space where you can exchange resources as well. Okay, and, and um, insightful thoughts also. Okay, so that's in essence the, what we offer. Um, I'm going to get to this, this one a little bit later. I think this is the point where I stop now because uh, Dr. Perama will then take us to the next part, which is uh, your research topic or your interest. Okay. While she's coming up, can I just check if there are questions in the meantime on that earlier part that I've presented? And I just want to check the chat as well. Okay, so there's no questions in the chat yet. Any questions in relation to what makes us distinct and what it means for your proposed research? Nothing yet? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Afternoon, colleagues, and um, especially to the colleagues on the online platform. I can't see your names at the moment, but I think that our cameras on on me and um, you can see us and so welcome feel very welcome i know that it's a cold day so you need to be warm and we don't have anything warm in the packets but just make yourself <laughs> warm by whatever we have in those packets for you those of you online i'm sorry you don't have any packets you didn't come so <laughs> so sorry for you so the question i want to just start with is how many of you are are afraid of research because when I was inviting people to today's workshop um, I got a sense that there's some kind of fear so how many of you are afraid of research and on the online platform you can just raise your hand also I'm not going to ask you to speak further just to hear if you're afraid of research 
Okay. Now then, then it's good to know that you are in safe, safe company because the rest of the colleagues are not afraid of research. <laughs> you see, and on the online platform, Philip, what are we seeing? Okay, we're seeing some hands going up. Now I just want to talk through what is your, what are your research interests? And I started by asking if you're afraid of research and to link the two things. And the reason sometimes that we get scared of research is because we fear the complexity of research. Is it the complexity of research or is it the complexity of the reading and writing? And I think sometimes it's about the reading and writing and us thinking that we're not good enough to do that scientific work. Remember also that research was not produced by, the concept of research was not produced by many of us sitting here that look like us. And that's the decolonial focus that Prof is also talking about, okay? So just to bear that in mind and to know that we now are occupying the space and we will make a difference with our research that we are doing in the languages, in the ways in which we, expo uh, we want to express it, that will be acceptable and we work through it with our supervisors. So I think although we're still writing in English, just to bear in mind that language is also a barrier. So when we go into what are your research interests, there are a few things that we have to take into consideration when we look at how we develop an interest. And so I just started in my teacher mode and I'm asking you to please look at this slide. Am I not so clever with all these colors, guys? Check my colors. <laughs> okay, so, so what do I do drag and drop? Oh, okay, let's drop it here. Okay, so I'm asking us to think together, you know, um, firstly, in terms of what is the world grappling with in social work. So if you were to just talk to somebody next to you for a, for a brief moment, what is the world grappling with in social work at the moment? And on the online platform, you can just uh, uh, deposit it in the chat, please. All right. I like that we're seeing, we're seeing quite a bit on the, on the chat coming through, thanks to the colleagues online. In the room, are we ready to share one or two at least? Please? Is anyone ready to share at least one? And you know the danger of this is that I only know a few names, so I'm going to call a few. <laughs> <laughs> okay, lovely. We would if I put it. We were talking about mental health. Um that our social issues has increased of Okay, can we just hear there? It's fine, we can hear you. Sure. Okay. All right. So mental health and mental health is coming through here as well on the online platform. Is there anybody else want to share what is the world struggling with? The world. What is the world struggling with in social work? <laughs> okay. Um, in in our discussion, we said uh, the world is struggling with the redefinition of 
uh, gender roles, um, which is now in many communities is leading into uh, uh, GPV, it's leading to homicide and a um, lot of other ills. They come from the fact that uh, the society has changed. And the other thing that we discussed, we said um, in many years ago, it was an issue of lack of information, but now there is abundance of information and people are struggling to process that information, which is making a lot of people depressed and, and, and frustrated because uh, and some information because of the abundance it gets into people that they know don't know how to use it. Like children, they have so much information and they self-destruct because of uh, too much information. Thanks, Mr. Lamani. Okay, we said that um, the world is dealing with the after effects or the aftermath of COVID and we moved from isolation to integration. So that transition from isolation to integration back into society or communities, that in itself is a challenge for the world at the moment. Absolutely. Thanks, Des. Thank you. Can we take one more here from this side somewhere? And then we'll give some airtime to the to the online participants. Anybody from this side? Substance abuse and children. Okay. So substance abuse, children and substance abuse. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So I'm just going to ask if, uh, Philip, if you can help us with the online, I'm going to ask anybody to just give a voice to your actual uh, chat, what you've written in the chat, please. You can just say who you are and then you can, you can give your input. Hi, my name is Jill, and I Hi, work Jill. for a I work for a, a company that trains students in um, the tool down mold making profession. I'm employed as a social worker to do all the one on one counselling and career development, etc. And I can say that I've been with this company for eleven years, and prior to that, I have a lot of social work experience, and we have never encountered as much violence and threats of violence in our student body as we have um, from January until now. It's been very, very disturbing. And I think that a lot of what is happening out in the community at large is filtering into our program. I'm sure I'm not the only um, social worker dealing with students who's observed that but it's of concern. Thanks, Joe. Thank you for that. Is there someone else from the online platform, please, that would like to share? We'd love to hear your voice. Going once. <laughs> okay, so we see many, we see many uh, contributions on the online platform and I think colleagues have been scrolling it up and down so you could also read. So thank you for that, um, for typing it into the chat. So I think what we've done here in this short time is to identify problems that the world is facing. You've also identified problems that the community is facing. And then also like the person on the Jill on the online platform said what the organizations are facing. So what I asked here 
is what is the world grappling with? Because there are big issues that the world is busy struggling with at the moment. Then what is your country struggling with currently? And um, we have to situate our research problem within that context. So we have to start with the world and the world knows social work, right? And then the country, and then it comes down to what is your organization grappling with in um, the various types of services that you are rendering. And then we have the big green circle that says, then what, can, what answers can the research provide? So that is how your research interest uh, generally is developed. But as you sit here at the moment and from the way you've shared, you've already got something going on in your mind, right? You've already got something going on in your mind in terms of what might be a research problem or what is my research interest, okay? So I'm not going to ask you to share that right now. What I am going to do is I'm going to then move into what our departmental research themes are. And I'm going to end with how do you get to developing your actual research topic? And I have a take home page for you, which you can work through in terms of getting to that point of getting your 25 to 30 words on a research topic, okay? And I saw some of you, when I asked a question about what is the world grappling with, you had to go to your phones. You know, because sometimes we are so disconnected, we feel as if we're so disconnected, but actually everything, as somebody said, that there's so much going on in the communication space, we're unable to pull it apart and say, this belongs to the world, this belongs to my country, this belongs to my organization, and this belongs to me. I think that's where we end up struggling. So if I move into the research themes, Why am I not able to? Oh, yeah. Sure, Philip, truly, eh? <laughs> you are not here. Okay, so our departmental research themes are these big, broad ones. So we've got four broad research themes. Under each of the themes, we have uh, smaller um, sub themes where you can situate your research. So if you figure out first, what is it that is the burning issue within your organization or from what you've been reading, what you've been observing and what you've been following in the, in the global space? Because some of you might not have worked yet. You've come straight from uh, varsity into the space. If you can situate that then within the research themes, that is how your supervisor also would be determined. So when we look at the sub-themes, you're going to see how this would uh, filter down. So we've got social justice and democracy. We have environmental stewardship and sustainable livelihoods. We've got origins, culture, heritage, and memory. And you might think, what does that mean? You're going to see just now. And then we've got humanizing pedagogies, which is situated within the education space. You don't have to take down everything um, because uh, Dr. Abdullah will share. Okay, so. So here are the sub themes under social justice and democracy. And I think they are so many, you can throw your eye over it because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read it. Because you've come to this session means you can read. So, so if you look at all those, I'm going to move the slide now.
then this is our environmental stewardship and sustainable livelihoods. I think you've heard of green social work also uh, in respect of the social work definition. The International Federation defines social work by incorporating green social work as well. And now you will see what are the sub themes that come with environmental stewardship. I'm trying to move. So the first one says nutrition, right? That block is on there. We are having very beautifully welcome rains. I just want to tell the people on the online platform. <laughs> and then if I change the slide to the third one, our origins, culture, heritage, and memory. And I think a lot of you have brought up a trauma and you see that trauma is captured here. And then decolonization is also captured under here because culture, heritage, and memory is quite a significant thing to every one of us sitting here, irrespective of our race and our gender uh, currently, right? So um, this is very significant. So if you look at your research interest, you can see whether you can link it to here. So I'm going to change the slide now. And then we've got the humanizing pedagogies, which is education. And practice education falls in here as well. As Prof. Goliath said, that we have many of our practice partners here. And you have a lot of input that you've been giving us over a period of time and that you would like to give us as well. And there are gaps that you've found that sometimes when you report it to us, we're not able to make the change immediately because we've not researched it. And you might want to research it and provide that evidence. And that's also good because then it incorp uh, sorry, it tumbles down into the theory that we would use in developing uh, the PREC curriculum. So the practice partners in knowledge creation, student well-being and student development, and that could be the student in PREC as well. So all of the work that you were doing for us, those um, colleagues who are uh, PRAC partners as well as facilitators. So these are our, these are our four main research um, themes and then our sub themes. Now I'm gonna end on this one, um, colleagues. So I was supposed to give you some examples of, of topics, right? Um, and current research that we're doing. So I just selected a few and I linked it to the research theme. And if you can read under humanizing pedagogies, for example, we had a study on experiences of second language speakers regarding English as a medium of uh, instruction in higher education. So you know the language question is a big one currently because um, the language of instruction is not necessarily the language of the majority of the learners in higher education. Then we have currently a PhD candidate that's researching the, uh, um, an Afrocentric approach to social work for practice relevance in South Africa. So actually breaking down the social development approach itself and showing that there might be another approach to social work. There might be something else that hasn't been considered and thoroughly interrogating what social development means and how it's actually linked to a neoliberal agenda. Then we've got uh, at the bottom there, Nelson Mandela University students' views on student participation in the process of decolonizing higher education system in South Africa. So that is also to do with decolonizing higher education and hearing from the students what they want to say with regards to what they are learning, okay? 
Then when we go to this very interesting one of origins, culture, heritage, and memory, we had this one, which was very interesting. Bicultural young adults reuniting with their absent fathers during adolescence. Now, bicultural meaning that the both uh, the, the parents are from different cultural groupings. And how do they um, actually reunite with their absent fathers? And so it was quite an interesting study, I must say. You must go and read, it's completed. And then the second one is, um, okay, I'm not going to be able to, to say the words. <laughs> so you will read it. Uh, <laughs> so Zuki, will you help us to read it? So you see, we've taken the research directly into the communities where the problems are, or we're problematizing what is happening within the communities. And then thanks to key perceptions of depression of black South African mothers in single parent families living in so low socioeconomic communities in Nelson Mandela Bay. And then we have social justice and democracy, some topics, the views of social workers in Nelson Mandela Bay regarding their role or roles in responding to the psychosocial needs of high school learners during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. And COVID-19 is coming up quite a lot in many of our, our studies as well. And we can cluster that under disasters and pandemics because the floods, we've had the floods, we've had the riots, we've had COVID, right? And there are several other pandemics out there. Poverty is also a pandemic as we stand here. Then the second one there that I've put out is psychological capital and coping mechanisms of frontline social workers from the NPO sector in the Eastern Cape province responding to the COVID-19 pandemic again. And then the last one is experiences and perceptions of caregivers of people with schizophrenia participating in a support program in a low social income Eastern Cape setting. Now for the colleagues that are actually online, I just want to say that your studies are not necessarily restricted to the Eastern Cape to Nelson Mandela Bay, it can be in the context where you are, the geographical location where you are, and we guide you through that process. So when you look at social justice and democracy, if you go to the sub themes, it'll tell you why these topics are seated there. Okay, so, so colleagues, I just want to, that's my last slide actually. I just want to leave you with, um, with uh, that page that Zippo is going to give to you quickly. So for the online colleagues, this, uh, this page that we are distributing here, I'm just going to read through it very quickly. It's going to, we will share it with you as well. Dr. Abdullah will share it with you. So it gives you something as soon as you get home today. If you can commit yourself to doing just this one activity, then you would be able to possibly get to the point of saying, I might have a research topic, okay? It might require you to Google some scientific articles, some reading, some um, other sources, internet sources, you might want to, you, you might want to watch a video, you might want to listen to a podcast on that problem that you're experiencing, and that's okay also. So I'm going to just read through this quickly. So it starts again with um, asking you to consider where are you working at the moment? Where have you worked before, if you've worked before? If you haven't worked yet, what have you been reading about or observing as a social problem in your community? And then what problem have you persistently experienced in your work? So in your caseload, in your community, or your observation of vulnerable groups? What has been done about this problem? 
So your own experience, what do you think has been done about this problem? What has your organization done about this problem? On what is liter literature saying has been done about this problem? And then we get to the research problem. How? What is the missing link in solving this problem? Because why is it still a problem? It shouldn't be a problem if we've done everything, right? So that is your gap. When we say, and you're going to hate your supervisor for asking you, what is the research gap? You're going to remember me then, and you're going to say, let me take this small paper out. So what is the missing link in solving this problem? That's your gap. Then you go and read on that. And who will give you this information? If you want to do research on this, who will give you this information to understand or to get closer to solving the problem? So that will give you an indication of who is going to be your population and your sample. Okay. And then you construct your topic like this. You will phrase that problem neutrally, so not emotionally. Because if you want to sway government and all that, you don't say it in your topic. You say it in your findings, okay? So you, you will phrase your problem neutrally, maximum 25 words. And then you might want to include the geographic context. Where is your topic going to be executed? Like I gave you those examples just now. And then you might want to put in who is this, uh, this problem? Um, where are you going to get the information from? So your pop population. You might identify your population and that is your unit of analysis. So in closing, colleagues, I want to say um, just to link up to where I started with what are your fears. I think that we are easily able to overcome those fears. How will we do this? We will believe in ourselves firstly. We'll dedicate 30 minutes a day to actually reading in the area that we're interested in. We don't have to read scientific articles. We can check the internet. We can watch a video on that problem. We can listen to an audio on that problem. There's a lot of media out there. And then we can write for 10 minutes. And I'll tell you that if you write for 10 minutes, it's going to end up you, you're going to end up writing for 30 minutes and you're going to end up reading for one hour. And that's how you're going to eat up this big elephant in those small pieces. So thank you very much. I'm just going to open for questions if there are. Thank you so much. I'm really enjoying your uh, presentation style. I do want to ask something and that is, will it be possible for us to receive the recording? Yes, uh, Dr. Abdullah will make the recording available and Philip says yes too. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are there things on the chat, Philip? Are there questions from the floor here? Anything that, um, that agitated you, that excited you? So by tomorrow morning, we're going to get the proposal. Go for it. Culture, heritage, and memory. Since I want to focus more within the organization, um, we've also sort of touched on the possibility of having an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary or between different faculties um, that kind of study for what I want to do because it's not pure social work it may touch on business elements and so on and I'm trying to see how will that work and what will it mean at the end of the day and we encourage that strongly we encourage the trans and interdisciplinarity because it means that we work as a whole so when you when you um, attend those uh, two-hour concept note writing workshops that Prof was talking about, you'd get to talk through it a little bit more and it will refine some more. And then we also look at your concept note and we give feedback and you get a chance to talk through it at the, at the interview as well. And if you're selected, when you're selected, then you will 
speak with your supervisor and we refine it. Listen, you need to understand this part that whatever you do now is not going to be something that we're going to cast it in stone. And that's the thing that you're going to research. You might come talk to your supervisor and change your focus. You might think differently and you mustn't think very big because a research problem is a small one that we can make a dent in. Thanks for that. Yes, Mr. Also, the, the, the topic that you want to um, discuss, it's something that you've done before, um, uh, but uh, it slightly has changed. Must you rehash the whole thing or can you make... Uh, because I'm just trying to look at the, the, the proposal. Do you, do you tweak a little bit of what you've done or must you redo it all over again? Okay, if I'm understanding correctly, did you see I'm using my social work skills? If I'm understanding correctly. <laughs> so, so, Ms. Lamani, you're asking if you've done a previous study or if a previous study has been done by someone else. Is that what you're asking? You want to take it further? Okay. Maybe I'm going to ask the colleagues to take that question. Yeah, Ms. Lamani, so we can have exactly the same topic research in a different context as well. So people, you mustn't be deterred if a study have been done on exactly your idea and you wonder who crawled into your head while you were sleeping. Um, you will find that when you do your literature search, you're gonna stumble upon topics and you think, where were these people when I was thinking these things? So don't be deterred by the topic being there. Your first call would be to go and read the work. What is it that they have done? And then what are those questions they haven't answered? that you initially thought about as well and even if it answered your initial question then what's the context and area in which they have not gone to do this investigation so it can be in a different geographical area with a different population group so yeah you you can you, uh, i think we want to start with work with what you have i think that's the most important thing it's a huge confidence booster for you to know that this is what i know what i come in with and then you're going to go and do your reading to see what the gaps are. And if it's a topic that you already have, which is what I'm sort of like gathering, it's your own. Um, and if you've researched in it before, and many people have that if you're taking your, your study to a PhD level, possibly, then you might take one of those, one of those research findings and expand on it. So your topic will change but your whole, um, your context, you will still um, give some more meat to that context to build up the problem for that thing that you actually lifted out of that study. I see that there's a question on the online platform here that is asking how will these reflective questions be made available online to, to online participants? I think, um, uh, Dr. Abdullah, do you have the email addresses of the participants? Okay. So if you have um, online participants, if you've RSVP'd, then uh, Dr. Abdullah will send it through by, by email. Are there any further questions? Okay. So if you've not RSVP'd, you can put your email address in the chat box here, and then we'll extract them and Dr. Abdullah will send to you. So what's left for me now is to hand over to um, Prof. Prof. Goliath and Prof. Keith. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Peramal.
Dr. Abdullah decided we're going to earn our income today. <laughs> so I'm just going to go to the presentation. Oh, that's my mic. Right, so I have my colleague on the on online platform as well, Professor Annalyn Kiet, who was on sick leave, but in all loyalty and excitement joined us online. So thank you, Prof Kiet, for being here. I'm going to just talk to us about what's the postgraduate programs <clears throat> that we offer and what does it entail. Uh, and I think the first one, so to date, we've already had 31 applications, I must add. Not to add anxiety, but to sort of like show the interest as well. There were 31 applications, and of the 31, there were 15 that's interested in this program, the clinical master's program, that unfortunately won't be on offer for the next um, few years, from 2024 to 2026. And that's a strategic decision that we've had to take as a department, you know, against the human resources that we have, as well as the progression rate that we are seeing with our clinical master's students. You know, social workers don't earn a lot of money, right? So 99% of our applicants in the clinical master's program are in full-time employment. And this coursework program essentially asks of them to attend four coursework modules during the first year of the program. And these four modules are taught in a block format. So it's five days per term at a time. And if you multiply that, it's 20 days from your research leave or your work leave, annual leave that you take. And that's just to attend the course. And then there's, of course, the, the leave that you want to take to do your assignments, et cetera. So the clinical master's course is a labor intensive course from a time perspective. And then of course the um, labor intensive from actually taking time away from your place of work, which you know piles up the work when you return. Uh, and I'm giving you that, that detailed insight as the experiences that our coursework clinical M students have had, right? Um, an incredibly worthwhile course to do. Uh, but for the reasons I've just unpacked to you and the fact that it then takes so much longer for our students to complete the qualification and then weighing that up with the number of staff that we have in the department, we've had to take the strategic decision to pause the program for the next three years whilst we then, you know, look at more creative ways to address what, what are some of those barriers that we've identified, which of course, as you can hear, is, is in the program design, but also the realities that our applicants are working, they in full-time employment. Now, the clinical master's course, apart from that four theory modules, I'll just explain to you, they also start with their research in year one. And what Dr. Peramal has just taken you through in terms of how to identify the gap by the end of year one, we want you to have a completed research proposal that's been presented at a departmental level as well as at the faculty level and ideally approved at ethics too. So technically you should be fit for implementing the empirical part in year two, right? So you can hear how loaded year one is. And I'm giving the detail again so that you can make considered decisions when you decide you want to apply for the program in 2026 for intake in 2027. The program then has a practicum component that you do in the second year of your um, training. And that practicum, we try to have it in your place of employment so that your work is not as interrupted or disrupted. And um, you will then have a clinical supervisor that accompanies you through the practicum work as well. And there's a campus supervisor that accompanies you during that journey also. And the program in total is 180 credits, very similar or identical, sorry, to the research masters as well. And you will see, or what we see, is that our clinical master students end up doing research that is of the same weight and depth 
as a research master's. Um, you know, because people are so passionate and they don't delineate the focus small enough to, to get the research component only. They want to do it as if they're doing a research master's also. So it's those decisions that you have to really think about carefully uh, when you look at the two master's programs that we have. The research masters, I'm going to pause, let me just pause to you if you have questions on the clinical masters program that I unpack now. Yeah, yeah. So we still, so the students that are doing it this year were accepted into the program this year which means that we're not going to consider new applications for next year. There won't be an intake for next year. So those candidates that applied for the clinical masters, I sent them a mail just now to you know, alert to the fact that we're not having the intake. The mail couldn't reach you earlier because this is still going through the institutional processes. You know, We had to propose to the faculty and so forth. Yeah. So there won't be an intake for clinical masters next year. What I want to emphasize here, colleagues, is that the clinical master's is a specialist qualification that was approved by the council fairly recently, just two years ago. So people are, we find when we do the interviews with our candidates, that people are attracted to the clinical master's because of the specialist qualification and registration that it offers you. Um, what candidates don't realize is that you can apply for specialist registration with a council as a clinical social worker, even with a research master's qualification. You have to, what the council does is that they then call for a portfolio of evidence and you have to show the work that you've done in the clinical context, like yourself, that's been working in a clinical context for so long. So they, Mr. Lamani, because the online people can't see who I'm talking to. So you will, the, they, you, they, in your portfolio of evidence, you will then demonstrate. You know, there's a guideline as to what should be in your portfolio of evidence to demonstrate the work that you've done in a clinical context. So that alongside with your degree certificate, which is at a master's level, is then considered and there's a panel interview. They also look at you don't need a master's as well for clinical specialization with a council. Very similar, you need the practice experience. So Mr. Davis, it's also nodding away that's been working in this area for so long. You too would then, you know, you do the portfolio of evidence and there's an interview with a specialist in this area from the council side. And that's how the endorsement as a specialist and also happens. Okay, so that we're not fixed on thinking it must be a clinical master's qualification that you get. At this moment, um, the University of Cape Town has a program of a similar nature and the University of Johannesburg have a master's of a similar nature. So those two and ourselves are the three with masters in the clinical area. Right, then the second program we offer is, of course, the Research Masters, which is, I don't want to minimize it by saying it's a straightforward <laughs> master's program, the research that you do. But essentially, it's yourself, your supervisor, your peers, your postgrad peers, and then your journals, right, and your participants. It's not the coursework that comes with those modules in the first qualification that I've explained to you. Does that make sense? Okay. Right, then the, the, at the doctoral level, we have the DFOL in social development, um, which of course you gain entry to the DFOL with a master's qualification in social work, but it can also be a master's qualification in a related profession, in a related discipline, like psychology, development studies, et cetera. However, you do need a bachelor's in social work. So for all of our postgrad qualifications in social work, you need to be registered as a social worker, which you can do with a bachelor's qualification in social work, right? But your master's 
can be in a different program and with that different program, your bachelor's, your M in a related field, you apply for the doctorate in social work. Okay, then I'm going to ask Professor Kiet to speak to us about the PG DIP in supervision. Um, Philip, if you are able to, if Prof. Kiet can't unmute herself. I think I can okay. unmute. Dr. Can you Dilo. hear me? Yes. Okay, I just need the slides to be up there. Um, otherwise, yeah, Dr. Dr. Dilo is doing it. Yeah. It's probably just that. Um, thank you, colleagues. I have to apologize because I'm really unable to even switch on my camera for you. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit of a ghost on the online today in this presentation. Um, but my conversation with you is going to be on the PG dip on supervision. And I'm just first going to maybe, maybe if you just go back to the first slide quickly um, again, Dr. Abdullah, just go to the first. So that's the official name of the um, of the PG DIP, the Postgraduate Diploma in Supervision uh, for Social Service Professions. Um, yeah, and we've done quite a lot of work already in terms of this process. You can move on to the next slide. So, the, so just maybe in terms of how where did this all start? So um, I think a lot of our social workers on the platform here, yeah, you are aware of the supervision framework that we are having and all the subsequent work that has happened in terms of the supervision framework. Um, there was a very heated conversations about this at the social work in Daba in 2020, uh, 2015. I'm not sure who from the, from the group here might have been there. It was in Durban at the time. And I think within all these contexts, there's been that recognition of the challenges that we have with supervision capacity in the country, in social work. I think if I had to maybe just say, let people just talk about what those challenges are on this platform, we'll probably sit here the whole day. Yeah? So what happened with all of this, these processes is that Department of Social Development, the national, then approached universities across the country, and they really were trying to get us on board to develop this postgrad offering that uh, 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 for them. They've done some ho homework for themselves already. Um, and then we needed to have, we had lots of conversation about, you know, uh, shifting changes, what should be in, et cetera, and so on. So this is where this whole thing started. Uh, NMU at the time, they also decided, okay, um, yes, we will get on board. And we started getting involved with all these meetings and the development of the program. If you want to move forward for the next slide. Okay, so as it stands, Currently, colleagues, I, I've just been in a meeting, I think two months ago, and realized that from all the universities who kind of committed themselves to do this, it seems as if our pro program is most developed, meaning that we've gone through the internal processes and the external accreditation processes, and there's just been minor recommendations from, from our external partners, from the HEQSF, in terms of things that we needed to, to chat about, but they were otherwise fairly happy with the program, okay? Um, I see the Prof Goliath, we all just have to confirm again, because it's either in 2024 or the latest 2025, when the program will now be fully uh, implemented. I saw on your slide you spoke about 2025, okay? Um, and it doesn't seem as if any of the other programs at the other universities currently, there's about three, about uh, it's about five other universities so that's also on board currently for this, but it doesn't yet seem as if they've gone through the internal, you know, uh, they, they've got the internal uh, 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 approvals sorted out yet. So this one is likely to be the first one to, to be on board, okay? Um, the main stakeholder here for us is the Department of Social Development um, in the sense that they've approached us. Now, this is obviously because the, the, the program belongs to the university, not to DSD. Um, but the, 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 as a stakeholder, they have committed to send the largest proportion of people to actually uh, participate in this program, okay? They will uh, make pro uh, available the annual budget for financially supporting the colleagues who are uh, with bursaries for the study. 
And we've also got them to commit that they need to extend that to the NGO partners as well. Now, we all had loads of conversations now lately about NGOs and funding, et cetera. So I'm 100% sure that in all of our minds, mine included, you know, you always have that at the back of your mind as to how that commitment will hold. But that was the commitment being made. Because if you think about what it costs people, this is a two-year program, okay? Um, that we are talking about. It's a two-year program, and the program should then be um, around about, it's close to 20,000 rand for, for, for the qualification to be completed. So, so it's not cheap, and that's why the financial commitment actually is quite important in terms of it as well. But they have started budgeting. In fact, they've already started budgeting for 2023, but the programs, none of the programs were ready to be offered at the time. Um, it is open to all social workers, community workers, and development workers, and child and youth care workers. So you can see that it is basically within our field. That, that the program is um, made available. If you move to the next slide for me. So the requirements are that you do need to have a qualification in each one of that. That means either your four-year bachelor um, at NQF level eight, which uh, a lot of the social, you know, as social workers on this platform here, you for instance would be qualifying for that. Um, and then community development uh, workers that I think in, the, uh, 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 in most cases also have a, a level eight qualification, or there is the level three, uh, sorry, oh gosh, uh, three year degree at the level, NQF level seven, that your child and youth care workers then also um, uh, speak to. So, so those are the people who qualify for this. If you are on an NQF level eight, it is, um, it is a parallel move, so you get a postgrad qualification that is equal because this is also an NQF level eight qualification. If you are, uh, um, if you finished at a level seven, that is then, uh, 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 that's then. So am I right now? Vertical, horizontal, okay? Because then you will do this qualification at a level eight, but you qualify for it because you have completed a level seven. So that is what you at least need to, to have. And there has been questions about the recognition of prior learning, which we've also built into it. So the university then will take you through. If you don't have any of these, then you need to have your portfolio of evidence going through the recognition of prior learning for the university to give a, a, a um, a go ahead to be able to be accessed in this okay part of the requirements here are that you need to be registered obviously with your professional board um, and you at least have to have a minimum of three years experience of practice and preferably now the word here is preferably because we don't want to exclude people who are not in in, in supervisory uh, uh, positions but the program, which is on the next slide, and I'll show you, also mean that you're going to have a bit of a practical component. And if you're not in a supervisory position, then you're going to organize with your workplace that you do get uh, people allocated to you for supervision so that you can do the practical uh, part of the of the program as, at, as well. So, so it's. So we do say it must be a minimum of three years because I think to go into supervision, you need a bit of experience. Um, and so I think the majority of social workers will qualify for this. Maybe not our so, uh, students who have immediately qualified the year before because you need a little bit of social work experience to be able to then make sense of, of this program as well, okay? You must be employed at least at one of the above social service profession categories. Um, as I've indicated, social work, community development, and child and youth care. So those are the categories that the program is currently providing for. And on this slide, what you are having is that you have just at a glance, you have a glance of, of, the, of, of what the curriculum look like. Okay, so it is over two years, it's part time. Um, so, um, and, and it's going to be at a hybrid level. So some of this uh, classes will be physical. I think COVID has changed, um, you know, a lot of our thinking in a way that a lot more of our work also goes online. Um, and you will see a lot of the theory modules then happens within the first year of what we are having. And then in the second year, we work on ethics. And because of the different uh, categories that we are having, uh, uh, um, professional categories. We are looking at, at ethics um, slightly separately 
for, you know, there's a different offering on ethics for the different groups as well. And then you have your supervision uh, practice, and that's your evidence-based supervision practice that you are having. It is a 120 credit module that we are having. Um, and, and yeah, so we're looking forward to offering it and we're looking forward to having people actually enrolling for this. Um, but like I said, the, the, the Department of Social Development will at a, on an annual basis make available funding that will help a lot of people to be able to come into it. I think that's my last slide, if I'm not mistaken. Do I have another slide there? Or is that my last slide? Thank you uh, very much. Prof. My last slide. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I did say to Dr. Uh, Abdullah, 10 minutes. I think I might be under my 10 minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much, Prof. We appreciate it. Um, are there any questions regarding this particular program that Prof has just talked about? Please go ahead. Mrs. Martin, let's run around. Let's go quickly. Boite, thank you. Now we need it for the online space. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Prof, for that pr uh, presentation. I just want some clarity, especially when it comes to child and youth care workers, because it's um, just in, in, in my district or in the province, we don't have people with uh, the qualification of NQ um, if it's a level seven. We mm -hmm. are now only busy training them on an NQF5. So, um, and I don't think we will have money very, uh, you know, in the new future to, to train them on a, on a level six or a level seven, because the first thing was that we must empower all of them to be either on a level four or on a level five. This is the first thing that I want to know about mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to child in UK. I also want to know that the um, um, uh, uh, program was designed and were there any child in UK workers involved in this program, in the designing? Because uh, we had uh, with NACCW and National Department of Social Development and other stakeholders, there was a, uh, a session, I think last week or two weeks ago, and then it was made very clear that they don't want social workers to design uh, any, you know, information or any um, uh, programs for child and youth care workers. So I just want clarity concerning that for that one. And we'll ask my second question after this. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Go ahead. Can I go? Okay. Yes, Prof, you can answer. Okay, I'm going to, to go to your last question. And I want to say that on the national committee, where these programs have to be, remember each of the departments. Um, so so the, 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 there has been a committee that has given a draft framework, okay? And um, according to my understanding, everybody was involved there. On the national committee, we, we then go and present this and we unpack it and we take inputs. Uh, child and youth care, they actually are presented there, okay? And they've asked very pertinent questions. They've asked the same questions that you've asked about um, the uh, um, NQF level process, because I think you, there is limitations in terms of the amount of, 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 of child and youth care workers who have gone through the formal three-year training. Um, so the program itself, as I've shown you now, is the one that was designed by our department here. And every university do that on their own, based on the framework that was provided at national. And at national, that's where community uh, uh, development and child and youth care and social work has been on the body to which we need to uh, uh, present what we are having. So the, the focus here is a, is a supervision focus, you know, not a social work focus, a supervision focus. And it is just to be able to, 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 to build the capacity to supervise people within the different categories. We have said, um, and that was also on the suggestions that we, on the discussions that we have at national, is that when it comes to the ethics component of these different categories, we have to bring in, you know, specifically the discipline specialist on all those 
comp on, 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 on those different areas there. So that's what we have. So it's not a training of child and youth care workers. It is a supervisory training of which people with the child and youth care and the community development qualification can then also enter. So that's how it is. Because I don't know whether that answers your question. Yes, Ms. Martin says partially. Thank you. The okay. second question, Mrs. Martin. The second question is about um, when it comes to, you said uh, national or I hope it's national DSD who said they have funds available for this it training. Is it is national um, DSD, yeah. Okay, national DSD. And then also um, that when you, your criteria was, if I'm correct, that you have to have three years, if I'm right, I'm not sure. Um, is the three years in supervision or three years as a social worker? And if it's three, three years, years in a, so three years as a social worker, preferably, so if it's, okay, go for it. Okay. okay, sorry, Prof. If it's three years as a social worker, and then that you take into because I'm I'm now a little bit concerned in, in, in if national was involved because then we have to look at the OSD, which is saying you know a certain level because. For a three years, social worker is still a junior social worker, and uh, that is not a person that you will be that you will be uh, uh, saying that that person will be able to to supervise some that you can supervise students. But when it comes to social workers, so I'm just a little bit concerned. Will I then, as a as a young social worker who have three years experience, been been sent by the department to go in, in and do this, you know, this training? So I just uh, there's just some some things, but I think I will I will sort it out with the person responsible, in our at our provincial office concerning uh, supervision. I will sort it out with that person. But thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Manson. Okay. Just a concern that's raised, Prof. Yeah. I don't but know if there's I, any can question. I, can I respond? Oh, you want to, to respond? That? Yeah. So there are two things happening here. I think that we need to. The, the one thing is that when are you eligible to do the program, this postgrad training? You know, we are saying this. If you look at that criteria that we spoke about, we said at least three years experience as a social worker, right? Then and, and now this this all of this has gone through and we have set at, at national with this so we've presented this as well, but we've also said preferably in a supervisory position, which means that you won't necessarily always be in a supervisory position by you know at the time that you enter this program. So we're not saying that if you're not in a supervisory, then you're not going to do the program. Remember, the program belongs to the university. The main uh, 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 um. What do you call it? The 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 um, partner, the partner. Yeah, if you want to, you know, uh, that has interest in it is national is DSD. That's what 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 this is. Okay, and um, so somebody can do this program, and by the time that they are a supervisor, so the time when when the the the, the department decide that you now, according to the years that you have um, experience can now enter in a supervisory position. That stands separate from whether you are allowed to do this training because the training you can do, it's a postgrad diploma, okay? And the department is prepared to add funding to that process for it. They want more supervisors to have more formal training. Um, that's part of what that's part of their, 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 their reasoning in this process. But the actual entry in the program, these were the criteria that we needed to put and we need to then look at in terms of what does standard, you know, what, 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 how is this comparative to other postgrad programs at other higher uh, um, education institutions as well. So yes, there is what you, you say at, 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 at an organization when somebody can actually now qualified to be a supervisor, but that, and that will have some alignment to this, but the three years is not dictating to the department that yes, you, now you have to apply, appoint this person, you know, it is whether they feel, you know, whether they're going to fund that person for that pro, for the training, like you do normally with postgrad training. I hope that makes sense that the differentiation between it being a university requirement and an institutional requirement. Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask that we leave it there for now. 
Um, and then obviously there's more questions, Mrs. Martin, you are on our floor. You can always pop in by prof. I'm sure she wouldn't mind yeah. that the two of you have a conversation around that. Um, and then I'm just going to ask Prof. Uh, Goliath to share with you our SLP. It's in your little booklet there. I gave you a little handout on our SLP that links to the clinical uh, social work. Um, and then after that, we'll have a 10 minute break um, just to stretch our legs. The toilets are to your left. So uh, if you, um, when Prof is done, then we'll have that 10 minute break thing. Okay. So <clears throat> just to let you know that we have a short learning program on the one of the clinical social work modules uh, in the master's program. It's the clinical social work intervention with families. So that's a short learning program. It is a credit bearing program. It's a five day credit bearing program which means that, um, especially for the applicants that were interested in doing the clinical masters or being considered for it next year, but which now can't for the next uh, three years, that uh, module, if you complete it successfully, that module then, once you are accepted into the program, is in a module that you would have done and dusted. Then it's three modules that remains. Okay, so that's the clinical social work uh, with families, intervention with families, and the details for semester two when it happens is on the, on the screen, but Dr. Abdullah also made a copy of the information. It's in your programs for you. And the online, people on the online platform have also received it. So the details of who you need to contact, the application form, all of those are attached to that information sheet for you, okay? It's, we have a hybrid format, so the two days are face-to-face uh, -face and three days online. We are revisiting it. We look at the number of people and where they are from. When we first introduced it, it was, you know, during the COVID time and we had it fully online. But if we see that it is mostly out of towners or we have, then it's a conversation. It's designed to be presented fully online. But ideally, you know, we, we've seen we derive more value with participant participation because there's such a lot of role plays and other things that take place in it as well. Okay. Thanks, everybody. We will now have a 10-minute body break. It's 25 to 5. So at about quarter to 5, we will resume. Dr. Pirmal, Mr. Lamani, Mr. Davis, if you can please take our seats, Mr. Queso, please <laughs> take your seats. Thank you very much. Online uh, uh, members are also waiting for us to start. Thank you so much. We are a little bit behind time, so I'm going to be a bit strict. I apologize. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the funding uh, that we have available uh, for postgraduate students. It doesn't mean I'm an expert in this. I'm just sharing the information. All the information is actually available on our website as well. Um, but it's just to give you an idea that uh, with the postgraduate funding, that there are some, uh, uh, fun uh, some funders available for social work. Um, um, postgraduate studies, um, and then there's, of course, for others as well. Um, so for the NMU, for, for you to go and explore our website, um, you need to go to the uh, research development site. The link is here, and you can go and see there's um, funding for masters, and there's also funding for, for doctoral. So you will see on the left-hand side, there's a uh, uh, a menu there that you can go to and you can go and explore. This is just a screenshot so that you can actually go there and look at the different um, uh, bursary sets available. So one of the bursaries that we do offer as the university itself is the PGRS um, uh, scholarship. So it's a postgraduate um, uh, scholarship that you can access. Um, you can apply for it even if you are not yet a student here at the university. You must, of course, be a South African citizen. You must be a permanent resident, or uh, you can be an international candidate as well. So it, uh, it doesn't um, necessarily apply only for South African citizens. 
the study is for full-time students only. Um, uh, so that is something that our department is busy uh, challenging with the institution because we do know most many of our, our postgraduate students are actually part-time, um, part not full-time. But unfortunately, at present, it's only for uh, full-time masters and, and doctoral studies. There are other criteria that you need to go and look at on the website. I don't want to uh, bore you with that, but you need to go and do your homework. There's a lot of um, uh, criteria that you need to meet and documents that you have to submit. It is an online submission, the application. Um, and usually in that uh, application, you have to indicate the program that you have applied for. Ideally, you should know whether you, um, you know, you're going to be uh, accepted in the program, but it's not a prerequisite. So you can apply and just indicate that you are, have applied maybe for your master's or for your PhD in social work, and then you submit that application online. You can make contact with the staff members at um, RD. Um, uh, and again, I would recommend that you follow up with a phone call. And they are also situated on 13th floor, am I right, uh, Prof? I think it's the 13th floor to go pop in there and inquire. And I'm saying this because they are inundated with emails. So it's best to sometimes just pop in on the 13th floor in the main building. We are on the fifth floor, they are on the 13th floor, right? So this um, applications usually around um, October, you will see there is uh, um, uh, information that comes out. So because you're not a student yet, you're not registered yet, you wouldn't have access to that. So you're going to see at the end of this presentation, I've already um, uh, started a WhatsApp group for prospective students. And I will send that uh, WhatsApp link to you and you can then join the group. And that's where I will share any funding information that comes on our memo system to you so that you can make your submission, okay, and your application. So this is just the funding that they have, the full cost um, of studies that's funded, and they also have a um, partial cost, so they don't necessarily uh, fund everyone full. So for the masters, you will see there for the full cost, they give 157,000 rand, um, and it's for the duration of your studies, but the duration for masters is two years, right? If you can apply for a six to 12 month extension, and then they will consider giving you additional funding. And then for par partial cost is 100,000 uh, Rand. And then if you're doing a PhD, then 165,000 Rand for full cost and for partial cost is 90,000. So that's for the duration of the uh, uh, qualification. They also do give funding for the full um, cost um, for both masters and PhD, a 10,000 Rand towards a laptop, for example. All right, and um, they also give for uh, assistive devices um, for dis um, disability uh, needs. They actually also give funding for that um, twenty thousand rand. The main thing is that you have to make sure that you finish your study in two years um, if you are going to uh, take up this funding. Um, you have to report as progress reports. Obviously, that needs to be completed, and your supervisors usually also involved in submission of those progress reports. Then we have the NRF funding. Yeah, you can apply if you are part-time or full-time, it doesn't matter. So you can apply for your master's as well as for your PhD. The entry age requirements for the master's is 30 years um, old and for the uh, uh, PhD is 32 years old. I don't know why they have that there, but yeah. <laughs> so uh, you can apply. I did uh, apply for this as well, and I was much older, so I don't, it's just to have that as your um, entry age. So, and it's really helpful. Um, it really um, helps you through, throughout your study in terms of, you know, making sure that you have the funds for the research, especially. You must be financially needy, right? Um, with a combined household income of less than 350,000 Rand per year, or living with a disability or exceptional academic achievers so if you've done exceptionally well in your master's um, or perhaps in your undergrad they will also consider you for the funding they also give full cost um, uh, 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 funding for the study as well as partial cost what's important here is that you actually have to have an idea of who your supervisor will be so once you've applied you can make a uh, have a conversation with prof uh, goliath please phone her or email her because that supervisor will need to receive a link from NRF where they have to actually say what you study about, whether they recommend you, et cetera. 
So please, if you're going to apply for the NRF, make sure that you have had a conversation with professional that you have the name the of your prospective supervisor, because that supervisor is going to get the link and then you have to, she has to complete um, the information. There you can also see that um, at RD, there's one person that's responsible for any information you need, um, you know, things related to the NRF, you will ask Terry Adams. There's closing dates that we have, internal closing dates that Terry Ann has to do, uh, Terry has to do some, uh, you know, administrative things, and then there's external. So please, you have to uh, abide by the internal dates for submission, okay? Again, it's an online process, and you can actually click on that link and then start that process, no? Then, I can't see the name now there, but it's the National Institute for Humanities and Social Sciences. Uh, this particularly is also for uh, master's and doctoral studies, also full-time, unfortunately. Um, and then it has a similar criteria to uh, uh, the previous one. And Terry, uh, Terry is also involved in that one. They have for the master's and doctoral, but they also have uh, one specifically for um, uh, PhDs, and there you must be under the age of 45 years if you're applying for the PhD. The closing date is usually around September, um, and they give a value of 140,000 Rand in the first year of registration, and then after that, there's uh, 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 different amounts after that. The period is three years um, uh, in, uh, for the PhD, um, and you can ask for extension of six to 12 months as well. So all of this information with much more in terms of criteria, the forms, the uh, supporting documents you must submit, it's all on the website. So please go and look there because um, this is just to, to kind of give you an overview. No? Right, this is a big one. So there's usually research costs. So if you're doing a PhD or whether you're doing a master's, there's a lot of uh, additional costs that you're going to incur and you need to know about this. Oftentimes, the funding that you secure perhaps might uh, cover the registration and the tuition and some of your research expenses. This is just an example of an estimated budget for your research as I extracted from one of the students' pro um, proposals, but it can differ. So every year it will obviously increase and it also depends on what people actually uh, charge you. But very important, you need to uh, uh, budget for uh, additional research costs for independent coders, for language editing. It costs a lot of money. Am I right, Karen? Yes. <laughs> so this is still a very conservative amount, but you can see what it amounts to here, 17,500, because all of these, these things add up. If you have interviews, if you have focus groups, I remember my focus groups, you had to have catering for the focus group as well because people come from in published communities. So all of those types of expenses, obviously is a test your methodology that you're going to use as well. But please have this in the back of your mind so you can start saving a little bit on the side. So by the time you have to do data collection, you have a little bit of a kitty to, um, you know, to use for your research. Also, please do have your own laptop. Don't use your works laptop. It's better to have your personal laptop and have access to reliable network and obviously budget for data, ideally have a Wi-Fi. Okay, and then, as I said, uh, this is a link to the WhatsApp group. I've started the, the group. You can access the link and I will share it again in the email that I'm gonna send to everyone. So that on that WhatsApp group, if you are there, any information regarding PG inf um, funding, any other PG information, I will share it on that WhatsApp group. I'm going to also add the academics uh, to that group. So if you have questions, you can pose the questions there. And especially in terms of the application admissions process, so that you know sometimes you don't get feedback, you don't know where you are, then at least we can follow up for you as well. So please make sure that I have your email or you have my cell number. You can even WhatsApp me, just so that I have uh, um, you know everyone that needs to be added to the group as well. Um, those who are on the online space as well, um, please make sure that you do uh, share your email address or your, you know, you can uh, direct message me if you don't want others to know your cell number, but you have my cell number, so you can also WhatsApp me and then I will add you to the group um, if you don't want to go through the link. Um, I don't know if there's anything else in terms of the funding, any questions online as well as from the room. Thank you. So hopefully you'll think about the budget. 
please discuss with your family if you're going to register because they need to know there's financial implications now. Thank you. Uh, we're going to ask uh, Ms. Uh, Makaita, Ms. Matsim Bumuto to join us now online. If you can please assist uh, with that. Makaita, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Your Could you hear me, everyone? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead, Makaita. Okay. Good evening, colleagues. Um, mine is to take you through uh, my postgraduate experience. My name is Makaita Matsubamuto. I'm a Master of Social Work, Clinical Social Work graduate. I recently graduated last month uh, on the 25th of, 1st of April. I'm going to unpack my journey. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, as you can see on the screen, this is the outline of the presentation that I'm going to give. Next slide. Okay, I'm taking the journey and the experience as a social work master student. My journey was a straightforward one. I did not walk alone. I had support system that uh, included lecturers, supervisors, colleagues, and family. Uh, the journey was um, a bit intense. However, one needs to have support system that would be able to support them throughout the, the journey. So sometimes the journey was rocky, like I'm saying, due to factors such as the COVID-19 pandemic, but then it takes one to, to push if they have uh, discipline and support to sail through. Next slide. Um, what motivated to get for me to study for this master in clinical social work was for me to get a professional training that would enhance my education and my career. And also, um, before I, I, I decided to, to, to apply for masters, I had to do a research on all the universities. And I saw that Nelson Mandela is a reputable university and their social work component was relevant to my future plans. And this program that I did, the Masters in Clinical Social Work, I had, had the opportunity to give me the practical exposure. And like I said, it was a reputable degree and it aligned with my line of profession and to also further my education and career. I also uh, wanted to have a, a study that would enable me to gain experience on lived experience, which means that the clinical aspect of it will allow me to also have um, a contact uh, with uh, real life clients and be able to handle cases and also to be able to marry the theory into practice. Next slide. I'm just going to briefly take you through the program structure, how the structure was. Um, in terms of the program structure, it was mostly block sessions and uh, it has the treaties as well as uh, that the structure was very favorable. Uh, to me as a working person, it allowed me the flexibility and time to engage in assignments and also time for practical expo exposure. Uh, next slide. In terms of the delivery mo model, we did presentations and we had a small uh, intimate diverse group where we were able to discuss, give each other uh, inputs and also do workshops that was done um, in, in hybrid one can be able to present and get inputs for, from their colleagues and lecturers. Uh, one can also engage with people who are already in the field. There was also peer evaluation and constructive feedback from lecturers and uh, colleagues. Like I said before, because of the block sessions, one would be able to marry theory and the practical together. We could also uh, engage and do case studies for practical exposure. Next slide. Um, I'm also going to take you through the uh, briefly take you through the coursework components, which involve case studies for practical exposure, discussions and feedbacks. Um, the next slide. Uh, the, the program made a practical exposure, which was one year. So I, may, I had an opportunity to do my practicals at one of the NPOs, and it gave me the opportunity to apply and test what I have learned 
It also helped me to have professional training as I was working with practitioners and professionals that had the wealth, experience and knowledge in terms of handling cases, in terms of uh, dealing with client cases. And it gave me the opportunity to also uh, deal with real life situations and be able to put, um, to put uh, what I learned into practice in a professional and ethical manner. Uh, one needs to prepare and also one needs to have expectation as you go into the community or with the, in the NPOs, you will deal with different clients. So that also enabled me to have that knowledge and I'm able to even apply it even in my current uh, line of work and even in future. Next uh, slide. The research component, which I said is a treatise, it was relevant to my career path development. I got assistance from, uh, from my supervisor. The department itself uh, can be able to assist you. So like I said, uh, one does not walk alone when you're doing the research, when you're doing the block lessons, even the assignments, you need to seek uh, support. Um, for example, in my case, uh, it was my first time or first experience to conduct a research that was quantitative in nature that needed statistics. And I am not very good in quantitative and statistics, but the faculty itself has um, uh, assistance in place for one to be able to pull through. In my case, I was assisted by a biostatistician so that I can be able to do my data analysis. Also, uh, the research component assisted me with working with professionals and getting guidance in preparation for my career, collaboration with other researchers. Uh, uh, one of the presenters talked about workshops that are available and also um, you know, research weeks and abstracts. So one has an opportunity to attend those workshops and trainings in order for them to actually enhance their knowledge in research, which I also got the opportunity. So the presentations also helped me to gain the confidence. They also helped me to be able to know if my topic was the right topic, if the methods that I'm using are the right methods? Do they speak to what I need to, to find out? Do they speak to what I need to also uh, put throughout there at the end of the day? And uh, I got an opportunity to present uh, last month. I got an opportunity to present in the faculty for the research abstract. And also I got an opportunity to participate in the research competition. And I, be, I got a second award oh on the... Um, master's category for the faculty of health science. So basically the research component as well as the, 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 the program itself gives people an opportunity to further and enhance their skills and to learn more. Yes. Next slide. And she um, an award for second prize. Second prize, yes, as, as, a, as a master's, in the master's category for the faculty of health science. Uh, preparation for future application. So this program also prepared me for the future ap application. It helped me in terms of working with the community, understanding the community and the people in a, bet in a much better way. It further enhanced me to be more ethical and professional, which helped me in my current work and my encounter with clients, colleagues and communities instilled my confidence in terms of my line of work and in terms of our opportunities, networking opportunities. Now I have a knowledge as in terms of if I need to gain this kind of knowledge, if I need to do research, if I need to do volunteer work in terms of this work or to assist in terms of which, where do I go? And then through workshop presentation during my study and practical, I managed to have a broad network of professionals and, and, uh, prof and academics that I collaborate with. What I want to, uh, to just tell um, the current postgraduate students and those that are intending to apply in the coming years is that I encourage you that you need to be prepared. You need to be ethical in whatever you do and also to be able to provide beneficiaries. When I'm talking about beneficiaries, I'm talking about uh, venturing into the work that will benefit you as, a, as an individual the work that will benefit the university itself to uplift the university's reputation, the work that will also benefit the com community. Uh, advantages of doing the master's in social work at Nelson Mandela University is that the university has got a very good relationship with the outside community. The department itself in the university 
has a fluid relationship with the community, which makes it easier for students when they are conducting their practicals and research, even when they're going to be integrated into the community for practicals, they're able to, no one would say I'm struggling to get this. If they seek assistance from the department, they can be able to be linked. So that is one of the advantages that I got myself as a, as a master's student. I did not struggle when it came to practicals because the university already has partnership with uh, the NGOs and the NPOs out there. So whenever they, they need um, students to assist or whenever the university has students that needs to have gain that practical exposure, they can be able to be linked. Next um, slide. Okay. Just uh, a take home tip for the prospective postgraduate uh, students and those that are already doing the postgraduate is that you need to plan your work properly and in time. The journey can be intense, intense, but do not leave things for the last minute. You need to be proactive and not reactive. Seek support when you need it. Work hard and do not tarnish your reputation as well as the university or the community's reputation. Finally, before I go, I just want to leave you with a quote that I, I like very much. I even used it in my research. Someone is sitting in a shed today because someone planted a tree a long time ago. This is from Warren Buffett. He wrote this quote in terms of business, but uh, this quote can apply to any venture that is worth pursuing. So the university has made a long-term investment in all their programs, including the Department of Social Work. When you decide on a venture like studying for a postgraduate in social work, know that there are people who have already invested in ensuring that the upcoming students benefit from it. Like I said, the university provides support. There is researchers, there are professionals, the academics that are there to help you. So what you need to do is to invest patience, hard work in order for you to achieve and make use of that shade or that investment that was done by the people that were there before you so that you can be able to achieve your dream. I thank you. If there is any question or comment, uh, this is the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malkaita. That was beautiful. Thank you so much and a lot of valuable information to share with them. Thank you so much. We're going to uh, pause for the questions. If there is, while um, Ms. Constable walks down <laughs> to the podium. If there's any questions or comments from the audience or from the online audience, you are most welcome. Ms. Makati has invited it, no? About the funding. Registration fees for masters. Yeah. Um, Prof, can you guide that? I think you usually can get a quote from student accounts. Okay. Prof is just going to double check, but I know that normally you can actually make contact with student accounts and they can generate a quotation for you, not just on the registration cost, but all the modules so that you can budget accordingly. No? Um, but Prof will check as well. And if it is available, then we can also um, share that with you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to welcome. Uh, our future Dr. Constable. She's currently a PhD uh, candidate and um, busy with her studies, and she's going to share some insights with you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you so much to my previous colleague for being so extensive in her presentation. So I'm not going to be, however, so extensive in my presentation. I'm going to look more at support systems. I think that you need to have your mind and your mental health intact before you embark on this journey. So I will be looking at that this afternoon. So that's us, hopefully, on our journey. And for me, what was very, very important is my relationship with myself. I, I just want to go back. I just wanted to congratulate you on embarking or thinking about the journey of enrolling for your postgraduate studies. So you being here today, 
I am so happy to see you as colleagues. And I really think that we need to demystify research. I really think it's not as complex as we think it is. So really, um, by embarking on your journey, you're really going to contribute to the body of research, which we so need in our profession. So going back to ourselves. So I think that it is very important that our mental health is intact because we will be spending a lot of time with ourselves. Therefore, we need to make time for our mental health. We need to know what drains our energy and what invigorates us. So how I reward myself is if I've written a paragraph or so, and I tell you, you do have writer block, um, I crochet. So that's my reward to myself. So find out what invigorates you. Then be assertive and have boundaries. I know in our profession, it's very, very difficult with setting boundaries. So communicate when you will be able to spend time with family and friends as you might not be as accessible as before due to the time you will be spending on your research. So we need to set those boundaries. On days when you do not feel like it, and there will be those days, continue. Even if it's just writing a paragraph or searching for an article. Secondly, which I think is very important, your relationship with your supervisor. I think my colleague before me also mentioned that. I was very, very lucky. My supervisor for my master's is also my supervisor now for my doctoral studies. So I experienced initial thoughts of confusion as I tried to identify what my topic for my research would be. It's very, very normal. Nothing wrong with that. But with help, what helped me was my relationship with my supervisor, Dr. Natalie Mansfeld. It was her, my relationship with her um, was instrumental in refining my thought processes. What also helped was to communicate. Of course, I had challenges during my journey. So it helps to, com to communicate this with your supervisor especially when you want to make sense of your confusion as your supervisor will assist you in crystallizing your thoughts. Support systems, very, very important. Talk about your research to friends and family, to, and to friends and family. Them asking questions about it assists you to make sense to others and to yourself. I've got a 16 year old daughter. I speak about my research to her. If she understands it, then I know I'm on the right path. <laughs> Surround yourself with supportive friends and family who will understand that there would be times when you will not be able to attend family functions or grooves with your friends. This is where your mental health and setting boundaries become applicable. The last one I want to talk about is resources. I've heard of these WhatsApp groups. I belong to one of those. It's very, very important. So join research WhatsApp groups and link with others who are on the same journey as they would be able to motivate you when you need it the most. Attend workshops. I also heard that earlier on. It's very, very important because I tell you as a more mature student, I didn't even know what the layout of a proposal looked like. I, need to, I needed to learn again how to do Harvard referencing. So imagine that. So these research really, really, these workshops really helped me. So attend workshops on research. These were instrumental in structuring my thoughts, the proposal, and the eventual writing of the thesis. Read, read, and read. As Doc earlier said, not only journal articles, but online articles read. Discuss 
discuss, discuss with anyone who is interested to know about your research and build a relationship with Ms. Bavuma at the library. She's my friend. She's very helpful with assisting you to find relevant literature on your research topic. Then I always want you to remember that the reward of obtaining your postgraduate qualification is so much greater than the temporary sacrifices that you will make along the way. And with that, I wish you nothing but the best on this journey. Thank you. Hey, colleagues, I'm on the very last slide here, or the last person on the program. And what remains for me is to talk about where to from here. Where to from here. current. You can hear me talking to myself. Eh? Okay. Right, so if today has been an appetizer for you and you feel energized to tackle this postgraduate um, application and this journey, you would obviously get your, your documents ready and um, the guide that Dr. Abdullah gave you, the booklet, has the details of our postgraduate platform where you will be submitting your application. Um, the next part that is available to everybody that's here, I see Karen frowning is at the time. So soon. <laughs> it's because these applications, I already told you that there's 31 applications that have already come through and that must be screened. And it's not a race to get there first. It is the impetus. We want you to now maintain this impetus. In this first workshop with Dr. Lujabe, uh, which is next week online, we'll, we'll send you the link. Everybody that then um, indicate their interest. In fact, we will send it to everyone that have attended online and, and in person. Um, so that workshop with Dr. Lujabe will help you think through the research question. It's from four until six to accommodate all of our working colleagues. And then the one that follows is in a bold up from it. So if you've missed the one on the 23rd, it's going to be very hard for you to, you know, be on par on the 30th because it's a consecutive workshop from the initial thoughts you formulated and the research question that you would have um, then formulated with her and her guidance in terms of how best to undertake this review, the literature review. Uh, then the 30th goes into what might be the best possible method. Remember, it is preliminary thoughts that you are having. We're not expecting a master piece, right? And you submit your best effort. The application um, details or the platform on which you submitted is in the booklet. It is fortunately going directly to the faculty as opposed to the gener general admissions. So from the faculty, it's screened and then it's sent to myself and Boy Tumelo that was here. So the two of us go through it. If there's missing documents, we arrest you to submit it. But your concept note must please accompany your application. And then the structure for the concept note is also what Dr. Lujabe will work through with you in the first session. But it is also in that booklet, the structure that you must, must follow um, for this concept note. Right, so that's the, uh, that is the next steps, colleagues. I'm going to yeah, conclude at this point and then just invite you for, again, we've got five minutes for questions on any of the aspects that have been presented to you today. Yeah. <clears throat>
So we will, uh, our cap is set on, we usually have seven for the clinical masters and 15 for the research masters. So because we're not having the clinical masters intake, we're looking at 25 as a cap for the research masters. Okay. And in the PhDs, we don't do more than five PhDs. Hey, okay. um, how many do we currently have? Help me. Three, it's yours and this. Yeah, the new intake is five. Yeah. But our current PhDs, we've got three or four, ne? For the intake, yeah. Yeah. Um, we do have, I'm wondering if you're making calculations in terms of the staff capacity and the postgraduate students, not <laughs> because we also have, um, research associates that work with us. So Professor Blanche Pretorius, for example, is a research associate that's available and we've just been very privileged to have another one. So there's a team of professionals supervising. Okay. Oh, Philip, can you check uh, the questions online? Okay, okay. <laughs> it's two, two assignments. No exams, two assignments, yeah. The short course is on, it includes family mediation, working with addictions and blended families. So those are the three broad topics. Two, two. <laughs> Am I sure? Your application, your online application. Yeah. Yeah. A paper screening. Yeah. And then we invite you for an interview if you jump through the paper screening. Whoops. And then there's an interview. And as uh, soon as you've concluded the interview, we send a, a mail to indicate acceptance or non acceptance. And then, yeah. Then the next communication is around registrations and stuff. Yeah, the intake is for 2024, application for 2024 intake. Yeah. So the funding that's available is for students who are registered full-time? Uh, we are pushing for part-time students to also be. Now, the funding that's available is for full-time students, um, but the NLF1 is for full-time and part-time. So that's the one you want to apply for. There's a lot of money in that one. Um, and, uh, you know, it makes life easier. So the NLF1 is open for everyone. The other three PGRS that's from NMU, we are uh, advocating for part-time students to also be considered and the other two that's only full-time okay do you reapply or you say i'm doing continuation how does it work it's a new application new, new application because you're applying for 2024 it's a brand new application so you you have to go through through this process again, yeah. So all of that what we've done today was to plant the seed so that you have some information before you go do your application, so that you have some information to consider before you 
actually submit an application. And that's why also we're having the workshop with Dr. Lujabe, who said, you're thinking about what is it that I'm going to do my research on. So this is just planting the seed for you to think about, talk to your partner, talk to your family, look at your budget, look at your research focus, all of those elements. So that eventually when you go in and apply, you say, okay, I'm committed like, both a uh, 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 postgraduate student said in their presentation, be committed, you have to be disciplined, you have to persevere, all of that comes into play then because then everything's on your shoulders, but there's a support team around you from our department, from the faculty, from the institution as well. Okay. Okay, Prof is busy answering on the chat. Thank you so much, Prof. It's a particular question that they can see now. Okay. Okay, then I think I'm going to take this opportunity then to thank all of you for availing yourself, for sharing the afternoon with us, for engaging around your PG applications that you're going to submit. I'm confident all of you will apply. Um, and I'm excited to, uh, you know, meet you in a selection interview and hear all about your topic that you've refined. And then I want to thank also the team that's behind arranging and making um, this possible. Thank you so much, Prof as well um, uh, for availing yourself and obviously for funding the, the event as well. We appreciate that very much from the department side, from management side, Dr. Perumal as well, um, as well as the um, Prof. Kiet in, uh, was um, absent at the moment. And then also to our presenters, um, Makaita as well as uh, Des for availing themselves and presenting and hopefully motivating all our students to present. And then Philip for our IT, uh, uh, um, expert as well as Zippo and Boiti. If I've missed anyone, Muzikisi, thank you for carrying the water. I apologize for that. Thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Colleagues, can I really just say a big thank you to Dr. Abdullah? She's conceptualized the idea of a postgrad orientation. That was her idea. She's going to tell you it's a team idea, but it was her idea. And she has worked tirelessly and meticulously to plan today even the directions to the venue. So thank you so very much, Dr. Abdullah. We appreciate you greatly. Thank you.